doctor versus lawyer. Hands down. The one seat there are, it's like a fast food service in, job done, out, boom. We are going to be doing something different today, which is doctor versus lawyer. And that's something we've seen in the thumbnail. And we are going to go through some fun topics and hopefully it will be insightful. So let's get into it. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Mirinvir Singh, an emergency medicine specialist here in the UK. And this is my wife. Her name is Bhavan. She is a lawyer and she specialises in litigation as well as property. Who's gonna reign supreme? Which one? We'll find You'll out. You'll find out. My husband has his wonderful red stethoscope. Money is no object when it comes to props in this setup. So it's my order order hammer in the courtroom. It's isn't a, that a toy? Yeah, we'll just put it this way. <laughs> yeah. We'll just put that away for now. But yeah. <laughs> so let's get into it. So first question is which one is harder to get into med school or law school? I'll let you go first. Okay, so yeah, with law school, there's many universities who do the undergraduate law degree and it depends on which university you apply to so obviously the red brick universities and oxbridge oxbridge is o oxford and cambridge and then you've got king's college if you apply to any of those then the criteria to get into those is obviously higher than uh, other universities that you apply to so the grades can be significantly different depending upon which university you attend. Um, but obviously, I, I think it's probably uh, easier to get into compared to medical school because of the vast amount of universities that offer that course. So for us to get into medical school, there are only 37 medical schools and there's going to be a hell of a lot more law schools than that, I'm yes. guessing. Yes. And that's where the difference is. So where we only have 37, all those students are trying to apply to those places. So for us, it roughly works out that for every one seat, there are an additional of three students applying. So that's where the difficulty comes in, in trying to siphon out the students. And majority of universities want medical students to enter by having pretty much straight A's. There will be a handful which just want two A's and a B. So it's pretty much, I would say, generically across the board, medical schools will have that higher level of competition just because there's fewer number of medical schools. Yeah, and you got something here. Yeah. So I think the average medical school is going to be more difficult to get in than the average law school. I think that's a fair statement. But then obviously if you're going to go to the best law schools, the competition there is obviously going to be ridiculously fierce as well. Yes. And obviously the criteria to get in is very high. I would agree with that. So next is time taken to be fully qualified. So you go first. So for us, most medical schools are five year degrees and there are some which are six years. Once you've got your university degree, you are not fully licensed to practice medicine until you have completed one year of postgraduate training known as your foundation year. So this will be completion of your foundation year one and that will grant you full license to practice with the General Medical Council, the GMC, as it's known here in the UK. So time taken to be fully qualified. So the law degree is three years and then you have to do one year postgraduate qualification, which is called the legal practice course if you want to go down the solicitor route or it's the BVC, Bar Vocational course, if you want to become a barrister, so an advocate in court. And then the gruelling side of it is uh, you have to do a two-year training contract. So you have to apply to a law firm to become a trainee solicitor. And that is probably the most difficult part of the whole uh, process of becoming a lawyer because the average age around, well, when I, when I qualified was around 27. I think it's gone up to 29 years of age. So it's very tough, a lot of competition to get that training contract. So that's quite interesting, 27, 29 years of age, because when we come out of medical school, and even when we've completed foundation year one, our average age is about 23, 24. Yeah. That's a massive it difference. It is grueling to get that training contract. There's a lot of competition. It's basically like gold dust. Getting it, that training contract really is. is gold dust. And I think that's where we're privileged as doctors is that that foundation years and the rest of the training is pretty much hand given to you yeah. once you've got the qualification. 
exactly, yeah. Whereas for yourselves, it's actually very fierce competition it to is. even just get that qualification of being called a solicitor. <laughs> so I would say law is much more tougher, hands down. And, and there's a lot of people I know who did the undergraduate degree and then the LPC. They did not get, unfortunately, didn't get a training contract. And that's quite a few people that I know that just didn't go into a career in law. Um, they either went into HR or you know banking or or other things. Other I things. actually had a biology teacher once who um, actually was a law student. Yeah, it's a very it good will, degree for a solid uh, basis. Yeah, it will bode well. You know, if you want to change career. You've got so many transferable skills. So I think that round goes to law. So now round three, the cost to get fully qualified. What's the cost to get fully qualified within law? So this is up till the point that you are now a fully qualified solicitor and are able to practice within your practice setting. Yeah. We're not like the hell. <laughs> we're not like, yo, bro, man. No, oh. no, no, we're not like that. Okay, so overall, it costs around £40,000. Why are you asking me? Alright, let's help the lawyer out. So, you've had three years at university. You've had a tuition. That's why, that, that is why I'm not a mathematician. That's so why I went into law. You've had three years at university. Three years at university. Tuition and maintenance fees. Yeah, so uh, when I was at university many, <laughs> nearly a decade ago, oh my god. Um, Wow, yeah. Yeah, so the uh, cost of the undergraduate degree was £3,000 a year, so it's a three year degree, so that's £9,000. <laughs> had to think about that. And then yeah. the maintenance is roughly the same. Yeah, roughly so the same, so that's 18000 18, Plus the uh, legal practice course, the postgraduate course that you have to do, which was £12,000 for one year. That's a hefty amount. So, we're, so we've hit £30,000. 30000 yeah. And that's what it takes, £30,000 to become a fully qualified solicitor. Yeah, thereabouts. But obviously now it's going to be it much, goes, much more. It goes up. Yeah. That's ridiculous, the price of that. Yeah, I, I think the LPC must be around fifteen, sixteen thousand 16000 now. That must put off a lot of people from applying. Yes, it does. That's a lot of money to pay to get a qualification for something. For something that's not guaranteed. Wow. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah, so you could pay that £12,000, £13,000 for the postgraduate course, but that doesn't guarantee that you'll get that training. So you can see why it puts off some people from continuing on with law. Yeah. Because that's a hell of a lot of money it to put is. into something where there's no guarantee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. And so obviously for medicine, which is a five-year degree, the tuition and maintenance together will be roughly around £30,000 when I did it. And then postgraduate-wise, we have raw college examinations that we need to complete different courses, trainings, and all these kind of different things that we need to attend and pass, they rack up the cost into several thousand pounds. So just for example, my Royal College Emergency Medicine examinations, I can't think off the top of my head, but they were reaching into about four or five thousand pounds. Wow. And then there's other courses in which, yes, you can get bursaries for through the different hospital trusts, but each of those courses are somewhere between 400 to 600 pounds each, and you're doing, you're doing at least a handful every year or so. And also the GP licences is quite a hefty amount. That's a hefty amount. Obviously I'm not yearly. a GP, but it works out to be several thousand pounds. And there's a lot of yearly costs for medical indemnity, insurance, signing up with the General Medical Council. There's a lot of money that goes out. Yes, whereas with uh, when you're qualified as a solicitor, so your law firm that you're practicing with will pay for your practicing certificate, any courses that you have. But that's obviously after taking that big risk of spending all that money. Yes. And then getting that gold dust of a training contract. But obviously with the larger firm and the Magic circle law firms, you apply for the training contract if it's in your second year of your uh, undergraduate degree. If you get into one of those, then you're guaranteed a place when you go on to doing the postgraduate course. But for everyone else who, who doesn't get into a magic circle law firm, there is no guarantee. Those magic circle law firms pay big. Yes. The payoff is massive. Yeah. Okay, so on to the next, the pay at different levels. So. For a doctor, this when we first stuff. this is the juicy stuff everybody wants to know. So whoever's watched this video up until this point, you know. Duh. Let me just pick my wad of cash up off the floor. Oh. <laughs> so for a newly qualified doctor, you're going to be earning something between twenty-four to twenty-eight thousand pounds, 
and that obviously goes up in increments every year to year as you increase in your seniority. And that's across the board. And that's across the board, so it's standard pay regardless of where you are and it's all dependent on your grade. So if you're a foundation year doctor, a core specialty training, going into be a registrar and then consultant. And even when you're a consultant, it's based on your years. So this is a pay scale and each year in training, you increase on that pay scale. So it's very much set. For a consultant, the base salary is 84,000 pounds, but that would take 13 to 15 years to get there. Wow. So it's a hell of a long time yeah. to be able to get to that pay point. So doctors really aren't earning those big bucks that everybody reads about. It's definitely not like the United States where the attendings are earning oh yeah, good there's money. A vast contrast. Massive, over massive the pond. difference. Whereas with law, it depends upon which law firm you apply for. So high street practice will pay you around twenty thousand, and then obviously the magic circle law firms. You're starting on probably around sixty to eighty thousand, and then when Flip you qualify, out. that's crazy. You're around. I think 80 to 100,000. So two, uh, you know, newly qualified solicitors could be on absolutely opposite ends That's of the scale. That's a massive difference. Yeah. The only difference is in the international law firms, you might be staying at work until 3 a.m. to, you know, close international deals, whereas the high street practice firms won't have that secured work life balance. Your trainees are earning more than our consultants are getting even after a few years of being a consultant. Yeah, yeah, in the magic circle law firms, yeah. I think you need to change profession then. Well. <laughs> so next one, rewarding nature. What's the job like in itself? So for medicine in itself, I would say it's definitely very rewarding. It's very tough as well. There's a lot of stress and difficult times that we experience. Yeah, there's a lot more stress. <laughs> especially since COVID came about. I still love the job and I love going into work every single day. And that's what makes my job really enjoyable. The best aspect of my job working as an emergency medicine physician, genuinely, it's because I get to work with so many nice nurses, healthcare assistants, different people of different backgrounds. Yeah, and you really have to work as a team. Yeah, it definitely... You have to be a, &E, a team player. Yeah, a and &E is probably one of the only places apart from the intensive care unit where every single member is literally seen as a different cogwheel within the same system. There's no differences between anyone yeah. and therefore we really work as one unit and that's what I really enjoy because... There's no sort of hierarchy. You're, there's no you're hierarchy. You're all needed in your own ways. Yeah. yeah, so it's really nice going into work and it's a level playing field across the board and it feels like you... It doesn't feel like you're at work when you're with these kind of colleagues. Mm, yes, yeah. there's a lot of stress, but this is one of the key things that offsets that stress. So another benefit is the rapid improvement within the patients that we get to see. So they come in, they're really sick, we make them better, and then we pass them on to another team so that they can continue the job of the amazing work that we always do in, in, in the emergency department because we're so fantastic. So a big shout out to all accident emergency nurses, healthcare assistants and even the portering team and the cleaning crew that are in the ED working so hard every single day. I, you know, Especially in COVID times, you know. Yeah, it's ridiculously hard and people don't get enough, you know, these people don't get enough thanks. So definitely from me, I'm always thanking different members of the team, 100%. I wouldn't be able to do the job to the best of my ability if it wasn't for all these people. And yeah, it must be so rewarding to see if, you know, someone comes in with a heart attack and you're, you know, on the spot, you then help them with, you know, a, r a rapid turnaround. And that's and the... stabilising them. Yeah, that's quite cool. That's why I love my job. So law, is it rewarding? So yes, law is hands down very rewarding and it depends upon what area of speciality you go into. And there is that cliche saying, oh, I want to do law because I want to seek justice for clients. And that is essentially what it is. You're going into law because you want to represent and you want to be an advocate for people who either don't have a voice or they need that legal advice to allow them to get justice and that's why they come to us. And then and then you've got the other aspects, so lawyers are needed for real estate and obviously there's no seeking justice in that but a lot of lawyers might go into that because they like, you know, being involved in a case 
from inception to conclusion um, and having a, again, rapid turnaround. So with conveyancing, you know, you see a case coming through and it's done within 12 weeks, whereas litigation can go on for years. So the next one is people's perception of us. So for us as doctors, the patients that see us actually don't see us as specialists at all. They just see us as we saw someone in the accident department and that's how they just notice us as. They will never remember our name. Very rare is the case that we even get a thank you or anything like that. It's like a fast food service in, job done, out, boom. Yeah. I'm lucky they remember me because of my turban. So they know me as the Sikh doctor, Yeah. which is brilliant, but they don't remember my name. <laughs> so where I don't think they remember anyone's name. Whereas with law, obviously you're, you're, you've got, you, re you really get to know your clients, you build that rapport with them, you know, especially in litigation cases where they can go on for months, if not years. Don't so definitely really, remember your name. <laughs> if they don't. <laughs> They'll remember your name. I, I obviously went, wasn't doing my job properly if they don't remember my name. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that would be quite worrying actually. Even in real estate, you know, you're working with them for good six to 12 weeks. So for us in medicine, family members and other people are thinking that we're doing these crazy different things and seeing these amazing next level emergencies. But majority of the time, that's not the case. In between seeing patients, we're having to do a hefty lot of notes, chasing investigations, reports, trying to get certain other things done like blood tests, organizing things for the patients it's not all the exciting stuff that you see glitz and glamour that it's not the glitz and glamour no no yeah it, it, I think it definitely with, isn't yeah i think family members think or friends that i speak to they they think i'm in court all the time arguing with the other side there's a lot of paperwork yeah. drafting yeah witness statements letters you're on the telephone to barristers on the to the other side so the conclusion i make from this is in both of ours there's a hell of a lot of paperwork there and is, there's a hell of a lot of telephone calls. Yes, and a lot of a lot of communication, obviously, with your client. You need to build the rapport with your clients because you need to extract the relevant information from them. So that's where our jobs are very similar. Yeah. Extracting information, trying to get to the end of whatever is going on, and a lot of paperwork and telephone calls. And a lot of pre like misconceptions about the professions as well. Yes. Yes. Massive. <laughs> yeah. A lot. So, last but not least, what people really think of us. Yeah. So for lawyers, we're perceived as maybe arrogant or uh, argumentative, always wanting to argue. Although we do a, we do do a lot of debating before becoming qualified. For us in in medicine, we're seen as caring, compassionate. Good bedside manner. Good bedside manner, loving, caring, sharing, everything. Everything's very nice. Whereas, yeah, I don't think we're we don't, we're not perceived. And trustworthy. Yeah. For both professions, yes. actually, trustworthiness. Obviously, yeah. The main thing for us is that we we you know we're up for an argument all the time in our professional lives it's true. and personal. It's true. And we're always debating, we're yeah. always like trying always to debating. to correct people's messages or the cards or whatever they you know. That's not the case. It we're, is. Not, we're not that bad. Correcting all my handwriting. <laughs> or correcting people's grammar and spelling and all sorts and always using fanciful words. Not all the time. Most of the time, yeah. Not most all of the, the time. time. Not all the time, most of the time. <laughs> so I think that brings it to a conclusion. So we'll let you decide which one you thought was harder, lawyer or doctor. Because to me, there's so many similarities and differences between the two jobs. There is. And I don't think personally you can pick one over the other. It depends where you have your own interest and what your interest might be. It's a very difficult question to answer. Which one's harder? Yeah. Yeah. It is a difficult one to answer. They're, they're so different. They're so different. They and, are so different. And to be honest, you can't really compare two jobs. No, you can't compare any two jobs, I, th I don't think. So obviously we're not as funny as Dr. Mike and Legal Legal, if you've heard of them, but we've, we've you know, put our own little spin on, on this so we hope you, So we hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I and... hope you found it informative, you enjoyed it. And if you like it, we can do a part two at some point. 
I hope you didn't find it too boring, we didn't bore you too much. And if you'd like to see in further detail about what's it like to be a doctor, I have some videos about a day in the life of a doctor and I will put them up here for you in the thumbnails so you can go and check that out. And I'll also put the five misconceptions of a lawyer to do with my wife's channel styled by PKD and that will come up here or here, whichever way I figure out to put them up in here <laughs> later on. So I will see you all in the next video. Look after yourselves. Bye. Bye.